The Graveyard of Space by Milton Lesser. He lit a cigarette, the last one they had, and asked his wife, Want to share it? No. That's all right. Diane sat at the viewport of the battered old Gorman 87, a small figure of a woman hunched over and watching the parade of asteroids like tiny, slow-moving, incandescent flashes. Ralph looked at her and said nothing. He remembered what it was like when she had worked by his side at the mine. It had not been much of a mine. It had been a bust. First-class, sure-as-hell bust. Everything else in their life together. And it had aged her. Had it only been three years, he thought. Three years on asteroid 4712. A speck of cosmic dust drifting on its orbit in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. Uranium potential high, the government had said. So they had leased the asteroid and prospected it, and although they had not finished the job, they were finished. They were going home. And now there were lines on Diane's face, although she was hardly past twenty-four. And there was a bitterness, a bleakness in her eyes. The asteroid had ruined them, had taken something from them, and given nothing in return. They were going home, and Ralph Meeker thought they had left more than their second-hand mining equipment on asteroid 4712. They had left the happy early days of their marriage as a ghost for whoever tried his luck next on 4712. They never mentioned the word divorce. Diane had merely said she'd spend some time with her sister on Marsport instead of going on to Earth. Uh, we'd be swinging round uh, to Sunward in 4712, Ralph mused. Please, that's over. I don't want to talk about the mine. Won't it ever bother you that we never finished? We finished. Diane said. He smoked the cigarette halfway and offered it to her. She shook her head and he put the butt out delicately to save it. Then a radar bell clanged. What is it? Ralph asked, immediately alert, studying the viewport. You had to be alert on an old tub like the Gorman 87. A hundred ton I had put in thirty years and a billion and some miles of several owners. Its warning devices and its reflexes. It was funny, Ralph thought, how you ascribed something human like reflexes to a hundred tons of battered metal were unpredictable i don't see anything dan said he didn't either but you never knew in the asteroid belt it was next to impossible to thread a passage without a radar screen and completely impossible with a radar screen on the blink and giving you false information you could shut it off and pray but the odds would still be a hundred to one against you there dan cried on the left the left ralph he saw it too at first it looked like a jumble of rocks, of dust, as the asteroid old-timers called the gravity-held rock swarms, which pursued their erratic, dangerous orbits through the asteroid belt. But it was not dust. Will you look at that, Diane said, the jumble of rocks which they were ready to classify as dust swam up toward them, Ralph waited, expecting the automatic pilot to answer the radar warning and swing them safely around the obstacle. So Ralph watched and saw the dark jumble of rocks, silvery on one side where the distant sunlight hit it, apparently spread out as they approached, spread out and assumed tiny shapes, shapes in miniature. Spaceships, Diane said. Spaceships, Ralph. Hundreds of them. They gleamed like silver motes in the sun, or were black as the space around them. They tumbled slowly in incredible slow motion, end over end and around and around each other, as if they had been suspended in a slowly boiling liquid instead of the dark emptiness of space. That's a sargasso, Ralph said, but, but we're of course, I know it. The radar was probably able to miss things in our way, but failed to compensate afterwards and bring us back to course now. Suddenly Ralph died for the controls. The throbbing rockets of the Gorman 87 had not responded to the radar warning. They were rocketing on toward the Sargasso, rapidly, dangerously. Hold on to something! Ralph hollered and punched full power in the left rockets and braking power in the right forward rockets simultaneously, attempting to stand the Gorman 87 on its head and fight off the deadly gravitational attraction of the Sargasso. The Gorman 87 shuddered like something alive, and Ralph felt himself thrust to the left and forward violently. His head struck the radar screen, and, as if mocking him, the radar bell clanged its warning. He thought he heard Diane scream. Then he was trying to stand, but the gravity of sudden acceleration gripped him with a giant hand, and he slumped back slowly, aware of a wetness seeping from his nose, his ears. 
all of space opened and swallowed him and he went down trying to reach for diane's hand but she withdrew it and then the blackness like some obscene mouth as large as the distance from here to alpha centauri swallowed him are you all right diane he asked he was on his knees his head ached and one of his legs felt painfully stiff but he had crawled over to where diane was down flat on her back behind the pilot chair he found the water tank unsprung and brought her some and in a few moments she blinked her eyes and looked at him cold she said he had noticed it but he was still numb and only half conscious half of his faculties working it was cold he felt that now and he was giddy and growing rapidly more so as if they did not have sufficient oxygen to breathe then he heard it a slow steady hissing probably the sound feared most by spacemen air escaping dan looked at him for god's sake ralph she cried find it he found it and patched it and was numb with the cold and barely conscious when he had finished diane came to him and squeezed his hand and that was the first time they touched since they had left the asteroid then they rested for a few moments and drank some of the achingly cold water from the tank and got up and went to the viewport they had known it but confirmation was necessary they looked outside they were within the sargasso the battered derelict ships rolled and tumbled and spun out there slowly unhurried in a mutual gravitational field which their own gorman eighty seven had disturbed it was a sargasso like the legendary sargasso seas of earth's early sailing days becalmed seas seas without wind with choking sargasso weeds seas that snared and entrapped can we get out diane asked he shrugged that depends how strong the pull of gravity is whether the gorman's rocket drive is still working if we can repair the radar we'd never get out without the radar i'll get something to eat she said practically you see about the radar dan went aft while he remained there in the tiny control cabin by the time she brought the heated cans back with her he knew it was hopeless dan was not the sort of woman you had to humour about a thing like that she handed him a can of pork and beans and looked at his face and when he nodded she said it's no use we could fix it the scopes were just wore out dan hell if they hadn't been replaced since the tub rolled off the assembly line there thirty years old she's eighty seven is there anything we can do he shrugged we're gonna try we'll check the air and water and see what we have then we start looking start looking i, I don't understand for series eighty gorman cruiser dan's eyes widened you mean out there i mean out there if we find a series eighty cruiser and we might and if i'm able to transfer the radar scopes if i find them in good shape then we have a chance dan nodded slowly if there are any other minor repairs to make i can make them while you look for series eighty gorman ralph shook his head we'll probably only have a few hours of air to spare dan if we both look we'll cover more ground i hate to ask you because it won't be pretty out there but it might be our only chance i'll go of course ralph yes what what is this sargasso anyway he shrugged as he read the meters and the compressed air tanks four tanks full with ten hours of air for two in each one tank half full five hours five plus forty forty-five hours of air they would need a minimum of thirty-five hours to reach mars no one knows for sure about sargasso he said wanting to talk wanting to dispel his own fear so he had not communicated to her as he took the spacesuits down from their rack and began to climb into one they don't think it's anything but ships though it started with a few ships then more and more trapped by mutual gravity it got bigger and bigger and i think there were almost a thousand derelicts here now there's talk of blasting them clear of salvaging them for metals and so on but so far the planetary governments haven't co cooperated but how did the first ships get here it doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference one theory is ships only and maybe a couple of hunks of meteoric debris in the beginning another theory says there may be a particularly heavy small asteroid in this maze of wrecks somewhere you know super heavy stuff with the atoms stripped of their electrons and the nuclei squeezed together weighing in the neighbourhood of a couple of tons per square inch that could account for the beginning but once the thing got started the wrecked ships account for more wrecked ships and pretty soon you have our sargasso diane nodded and said you can put my hammer on now all right don't forget to check the radio with me before we go out if the radio doesn't work then you stay here because i want us in constant radio contact if we're both out there is that understood yes sir captain 
she said and grinned. It was her old grin. He had not seen her grin like that for a long time. He had almost forgotten what that grin was like. It made her face seem younger and prettier, as he had remembered it from what seemed so long ago, but was only three years. It was a wonderful grin, and he watched it in the split second which remained before he swung the heavy helmet up and in place over his shoulders. Then he put on his own helmet awkwardly and fingered the outside radio controls. Who knew? he said. I can hear you. The voice was metallic, but very clear through the suit radios. Then listen. There shouldn't be any danger of getting lost. I'll leave a light on inside the ship, and we'll see it through the ports. It'll be the only light, so whatever you do, don't go out of range. As long as you can always see it, you'll be okay, understand? Right, she said as they both climbed into the Gorman 87's airlock and waited for the pressure to leave it and the outer door to swing out into space. Ralph, I'm a little scared. Ralph? That's all right, he said. So am I. What did you mean it won't be pretty out there? Because we'll have to look not just for Series 80 Gormans, but for any ships that look as old as ours. There ought to be plenty of them, and any of them could have had a Gorman radioscope, although it's unlikely. Have a look there. But what won't be pretty? We'll have to enter those ships. You won't like what's inside. Say, how will you get in? We don't have blasters or weapons of any kind. The suit rockets, Ralph said. You swing around and blast with your suit rockets. A porthole should be better than an airlock if it's big enough to climb through. You won't have any trouble. But you still haven't told me what... Inside the ships, people. They'll all be dead. If they didn't lose their air, they'll lose it when we get in. Either way, of course, they'll be dead. They've all been dead for years. With no food. But without air. What are you stopping for? They answered. Please go on. A body without air. Fifteen pounds of pressure per square inch in the inside and zero on the outside. It isn't pretty. It bloats. My God, Ralph. Sorry, kid. Maybe you want to stay back here and I'll look. You said we only have ten hours. I want to help you. All at once the airlock swung open. Space yawned at them. Black, enormous. The silent ships, the dead Sargasso ships, floating slowly by eternally unhurried better make it eight hours ralph said over the suit radio we'd better keep a couple of hours leeway in case i figured wrong eight hours my remember don't get out of sight in the ship's lights and don't break radio contact under any circumstances these suit radios work like miniature radar sets too if anything goes wrong we'll be able to track each other it's directional beam radio but what can go wrong i don't know ralph admitted nothing probably he turned on his suit rockets and felt the sudden surge of power drive him clear of the ship. He watched Diane rocketing away from him to the right. He waved his hand in the bulky spacesuit. Good luck, he called. I love you, Diane. Ralph, she said, her voice caught. He heard it catch over the suit radio. Ralph, we agreed never to... Forget it. Good luck, Ralph. Good luck. And I... You what? Nothing, Ralph. Good luck. Good luck, he said, and headed for the first jumble of space wrecks. It would probably have taken them a month to explore all the derelicts were, which were old enough to have Gorman Steery's 80 radar scopes. Theoretically, Ralph realised, even a newer ship could have one. But it wasn't likely, because if someone could afford a newer ship, then he could afford a better radar scope. But that, he told himself, was only half the story. The other half was this. With a better radar scope, a ship might not have floundered into the Sargasso at all. So it was hardly possible to pass up any ship if their life depended on it. And the going was slow. Too slow. He had entered some dozen ships in the first four hours, turning, using his shoulder rockets to blast a porthole out and climb in through there. He had not liked what he saw, but there was no preventing it. Without a light it wasn't so bad, but you needed a light to examine the radar scope. They were dead. They had been dead for years, but of course there would be no decomposition in the airless void of space, and very little, even if air had remained until he blasted his way in, for the air was sterile, canned spaceship air. They were dead, and they were bloated, all impossibly fat men, with white faces like melons and gross bodies like Tweedledees and limbs like fat sausages. By the fifth ship he was sick to his stomach. 
but by the tenth he had achieved the necessary detachment to continue his task. Once, it was the eighth ship, he found a Gorman Series 80 radar scope, and his heart pounded when he saw it. But the scope was hopelessly damaged, as bad as their own. Aside from that one, he did not encounter any, damaged or in good shape, which they might convert to their own use. Four hours, he thought, four hours and twelve ships, Dan reported every few moments by intercom. In her first few hours, she had visited eight ships. Her voice sounded funny. She was fighting it every step of the way, he thought. It must have been hell to her, breaking into those wrecks with their dead men with faces like white, bloated melons. In the thirteenth ship, he found a skeleton. He did not report it to Diane over the intercom. The skeleton made no sense at all. The flesh could not possibly have decomposed. Curious. He clumped closer on his magnetic boots. Even if the flesh had decomposed, the clothing would have remained. But it was a skeleton, picked completely clean with no clothing, not even boots, as if the man had stripped of his clothing first. He found out why a moment later, and it left him feeling more than a little sick. There were other corpses aboard the ship, a battered Thompson 81 in worse shape than their own Gorman, bodies, not skeletons, but when they had entered the Sargasso they had apparently struck another ship. One whole side of the Thompson was smashed in, and Ralph could see the repair patches on the wall. Near them, and thoroughly destroyed, were the Thompson's spacesuits. The galley lockers were empty when Ralph found them, all the food gone how many years ago, one of the crew dying for the others. Cannibalism. Shuddering. Ralph rocketed outside into the clear darkness of space. That was a paradox, he thought. It was clear or white, but it was dark. You could see a great way. You could see a million, million miles. But it was darker than anything on Earth. It was almost an extra-dimensional effect. It made their third dimension on Earth, the dimension of depth, seem hopelessly flat. Ralph! Go ahead, kid, he said. It was the first radio contact in almost half an hour. Oh, Ralph, it's a Gorman, an 85, I think. Right in front of me. Ralph, if it scopes are good. Oh, Ralph! I'm coming, he said. Go ahead inside. I'll pick up your beam and be along. He could feel his heart thumping wildly. Five hours now. They did not have much time. This ship, this Gorman 85, which, which Diane had found, would be their last chance. Because it would certainly take him all three hours to transfer the radar scope, using the rockets from one of the spacesuits, to their own ship. He rocketed along now, following her directional beam, and listened as she said, I'm cutting through the porthole now, Ralph. I, his voice stopped suddenly. It did not drift off gradually. It merely ceased without warning, without reason. Diane, he called. Diane, can you hear me? He tracked the beam in desperate silence. Wrecks flashed by, tumbling slowly in their web of mutual gravitation. Some were molten silver if the one sunlight caught them. Some were black, but every rivet, every seam was distinct. The impossible clarity of blackest space. Ralph, her voice came suddenly. Yes, Diane. Yes, what is it? What a curious thing. I stopped blasting at the porthole. I'm not going in that way. The airlock, Ralph. What about the airlock? It opened up on me. It swung out into space. All of a sudden, I'm going in, Ralph. Fear, unexpected, inexplicable, gripped him. Don't, he said. Wait for me. That's silly, Ralph. We barely have time. I'm going in now, Ralph. There, I'm closing the outer door. I wonder if the pressure will build up for me. If it doesn't, I'll blast the outer door with my rockets and get out of here. Ralph, the light's blinking. The pressure's building. The inner door is beginning to open, Ralph. I'm going inside now. He was still tracking the beam. He thought he was close now, a hundred miles, perhaps. A hundred miles by suit rocket was merely a few seconds, but somehow the fear was still with him. It was that skeleton, he thought. That skeleton had unnerved him. Ralph, it's here, Ralph, a radar scope, just like ours. Oh, Ralph, it's in perfect shape. I'm coming, he said. A big old Bartson cruiser tumbled by, end over end, a thousand tonner, the largest ship he had seen in here so far. At some of the portholes, as he flashed by, he could see faces, dead faces, staring into space forever. Then Diana's voice suddenly. Is that you, Ralph? I'm still about fifty miles out, he said automatically, and then cold fear, real fear, gripped him. Is that you, Ralph? Ralph! Is that... Oh, Ralph! Ralph! She screamed and was silent. 
Damn! Damn, answer me! Silent. She had seen someone. Something. Alive. It hardly seemed possible. He tried to notch his rocket controls further toward full power, but they were straining already. The dead ships flashed by, scores of them, hundreds with dead men and dead dreams inside, waiting through eternity, in no hurry to give up their corpses and corpses of dreams. He heard Diane again then, a single agonized scream, then there was silence, absolute silence. Time seemed frozen, frozen like the faces of the dead men inside the ships suspended, unmoving, not dropping into the well of the past. The ships crawled by now, crawled, and from a long way off he saw the Gorman 85. He knew it was the right ship, because the outer airlock door had swung open again. It hung there in space, the lock gaping, but it was a long way off. He hardly seemed to be approaching it at all. Every few seconds he called Diane's name, but there was no answer no answer time crawled with the fear icy now as cold as death in the pit of his stomach with fear making his part pound rapidly with the fear making it impossible for him to think fear for diane i love you die he thought i love you i never stopped loving you we were wrong we were crazy wrong it was like a sargasso inside of us an emptiness which needed filling. But we were wrong. Diane. He reached the Gorman and plunged inside the airlock, swinging the outer door shut behind him. He waited, with the pressure build up again as it had built up for Diane. He did not know. He could only wait. A red light blinked over his head, on and off, on and off, as pressure was built. Then it stopped. Fifteen pounds of pressure in the airlock, which meant that the inner door should open. He ran forward, rammed his shoulder against it, tumbled through. He entered a narrow companionway and clomped awkwardly toward the front of the ship, where the radar scope would be located. He passed a skeleton in the companionway, like the one he had seen in another ship. For the same reason, he thought. He had time to think that, and then he saw them. Diane, on the floor, her spacesuit off her now, a great bruise, blue ugly bruise across her temple unconscious, and the thing which hovered over her. At first he didn't know what it was, but he leaped at it, it turned, snarling. There was an air in the ship, and he wondered about that. He did not have time to wonder. The thing was like some monstrous misshapen creature, a man, yes, but a man to give you nightmares, bent and misshapen, gnarled, twisted like the roots of an ancient tree, with a wild growth of beard, white beard, heavy across the chest, with bent limbs powerfully muscled and a gaunt face like death's hand and the eyes the eyes were wild staring vacantly almost glazed as in death the eyes stared at him and through him and then he closed with this thing which had felled diane it had incredible strength the strength of the insane it drove ralph back across the cabin and ralph encumbered by his spacesuit could only fight awkwardly it drove him back and it found something on the floor, the metal log of what once had been a chair, and slammed it down across the faceplate of Ralph's spacesuit. Ralph staggered, fell to his knees. He had absorbed the blow on the crown of his skull to the helmet of the suit, and it dazed him. The thing struck here again, and Ralph felt himself falling. Somehow he climbed to his feet again. The thing was back over Dan's still form again, looking at her, its eyes staring and vacant. Spittle drooled from the lips. Then Ralph was wrestling with it again. The thing was almost protean it all but seemed to change its shape and writhe from ralph's grasp as they struggled across the cabin but this time there was no weapon for it to grab and use with stunning force half crazed himself now ralph got his fingers gauntleted in rubberized metal about the sinewy throat under the tattered beard his fingers closed there and the wild eyes went big and he held it that way then finally thrust it away from him the thing fell, but sprang to its feet, it looked at Ralph, and the mouth opened and closed, but he heard no sound. The teeth were yellow and black, broken like fangs. Then the thing turned and ran. Ralph followed it as far as the airlock. The inner door was slammed between them. A light blinked over the door. Ralph ran to a porthole and watched. The thing, which once had been a man, floated out into space, turning, spinning slowly. The gnarled, twisted body expanded outward. Came fat and swollen, balloon-like, 
came quite close to the porthole, thudding against the ship's hull, the face dead now, like a melon. Then, after he was sick for a moment, there beside the airlock, he went back for Diane. They were back aboard the Gorman 87 now, their own ship. Ralph had revived Diane and brought her back, along with the other Gorman's radar scope, to their battered tub. The bruise on her temple was badly discoloured, and she was still weak, but she would be all right. "'But what was it?' Diane asked. She had hardly seen her attacker. "'A man,' Ralph said. "'God knows how long that ship was in here. Years, maybe. Years alone in space, here in the Sargasso, with dead men and dead ships for company. He used up all the food. His shipmates died. Maybe he killed them. He needed more food.' "'Oh, no, you don't mean—' Ralph nodded. Became a cannibal. Maybe he had a spacesuit and raided some of the other ships, too. It doesn't matter. He's dead now. He must have been insane, like that for years, waiting here, never seeing another living thing. Don't talk about it, Ralph said, then smiled. Ship's ready to go, Diane. Yes, she said. He looked at her. Miles? She didn't say anything. I learned something in there. Ralph said. We were like that poor insane creature in a way. We were too wrapped up in the asteroid and the mine. We forgot to live from day to day, to scrape up a few bucks every now and then maybe and take in a show on Ceres or have a weekend on Vesta. What the hell die? Everybody needs it. Yes, she said. Die? Yes, Ralph. I want to Give it another try, if you do. The mine? The mine, eventually. The mine isn't important. Earth, I mean. He paused, his hand still over the controls. Will it be Mars? No, she said, and sat up and kissed him. A weekend on Vesta sounds very nice. Very, very nice, darling. Ralph smiled and punched the controls. Minutes later they had left the Sargasso, both Sargassos, behind them. End of the Graveyard of Space by Milton Lesser